Proverbs chapter 13, and verse 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. How in the world do you do that? How do you manage? Then there's another scripture back in 3 John, the second verse. Nothing really unusual about it. It just simply says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health. Therefore, it, there's nothing in the world wrong with us taking a little time today to talk about the hows and the whys and the wherefores of the resources that God places into our hands and what it means to be a good steward of the things that God has given us. Now, I'm going to proceed on a couple of assumptions today. I'm not going to worry about them unnecessarily. I'm going to assume that we all that, that, that we tithe, that we meet our obligations to God and the poor, which of course means that we are generous in our offerings and, and to, you know and tithes to God. That we also, when we come across a poor person, that we try to help. Of course, some of us may be so poor we need help. We can't help. But one of the things that I would like to help us to do today is to understand some of the reasons why we are where we are. Not all of them, by a long shot, because in 50 minutes. All I can do is address a couple of very narrow subjects, and in reality today, if you understand all that I'm saying, I will have addressed really only one principle in the whole thing. So I'm not going to uh, uh, be apologizing for talking about money and how Christians aren't supposed to be worried about worldly things and, and all that kind of thing, because I, we all understand all that. But at the same time, we also understand that it is okay to prosper, providing we have been rich toward God and toward our fellow man, and our attitude toward possessions is right. We also acknowledge the, that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. So with all the disclaimers out of the way, all things being equal, would you rather pay money to others or have mon others pay money to you? Somebody laughed. Well, now, yeah, now, that is a kind of funny question, isn't it? Is it a valid question? You bet it's a valid question. Do you have a choice? Yeah, you've got a lot of choice in it. The fact of the matter is, because those choices we make, we spend most of our lives paying more to others than others pay to us. And it's that choice that I want to talk about today and how you exercise that choice and what you do with the things that you have because I feel that in the long run, the church will be better off, and you'll be better off, and your family will be better off, and the people who know you will be better off if you can make certain kinds of adjustments in your life. Now, I think most of you would have answered, yeah, I would rather have others pay money to me than for me, just you know, all other things being equal, than to pay money to others. How is that preference played out in your life? Well, here's a little exercise for you to do as soon as you get home. Get out all you know your latest bank statements and a full set of last month's bills. Look at those very carefully and examine them. Most of the time we don't examine our bills. We look at the bottom line. We find out I owe $32.17 to the phone company, and we just pay that. And we see a bill that comes in from somebody else, and we, we just look at the bottom line and we pay it. We don't notice the fact that this was a bill from the plumber that actually the first time we got it was three months ago. And what we are actually paying to him is not only the plumbing bill, but two months of, of back charges that he has charged us, which really amount to interest or service charges, for money that we did not pay when it was due, we delayed it because of one reason or another. You will also find on your credit card bills the actual items that you bought, and you will also find a statement that says the minimum payment due. Have you ever seen that minimum payment due? You will also see somewhere on that form the amount of interest that you pay. Okay, go through and add up all of the interest, charges, everything that you pay because you are deferring payments on anything. And add up all the money that is paid to you in interest. You'll find that on your bank account, you know, your bank statement, if there is any. Uh, there will be a place where it says interest paid. So it may say if you have an interest-bearing account, it will say interest paid to date. And you'll have all those figures all laid out for you. And you can kind of see which way all this is going. Now, let me ask you another question. 
If you sit down and add up all the money you paid in interest last month, whatever that figure turned out to be, if you had that money in your hand right now, could you find something useful to do with it? Now, this is not then money that you really don't want, is it? It's not money that you're really prepared to sacrifice. It's not money you're prepared to throw away or flush down the toilet. It is money you actually could use. Now, I want to draw out for you a detailed example so you can understand what is happening to people today. This is a real example, and it applies to real people. My wife and I were sitting down discussing this, the presentation of this, and she had a great deal of concern in it because of what she's seen happen in so many people's lives. For those of you who don't know Allie, she's a real estate professional. She sells real estate. She sits in on loan applications with all sorts of people, and they, when they start putting down all of their bills and obligations, and oftentimes sees people who would want to buy a home, desperately would like to buy a home, but they can't buy a home. They can't buy a home because of all the payments they've got going out every month on all sorts of things. There was this one couple, and they are not atypical. They are really rather normal. There are just lots of people like this. They had, when we got down the loan application, a few debts. There was, for example, the MasterCard bill. On it, there was a vacation, dinners out, gifts, and the various and sundry things we go by with our MasterCard. They also had a Visa card, because the MasterCard had a credit limit. They got a Visa card. And so they had on the Visa card more of the same, personal items and different clothing and things they buy here and there. They count at Sears, there was a bill to be paid every month because of a new stereo they had bought at Sears. Over at Dillard's, there was another account that had to be paid because of clothing that they were buying. It's, you know, they're buying more every month at Dillard's. Another bill just like that one at Foley's for more clothing and other items that had been bought. There was also a bill down from SR Superstore for a refrigerator for television. I mean, not, not, all the items that were bought, I have no certainty about that. I'm just illustrating. The accounts are real. I mean, people have real accounts at department stores. And they have their Visa, they have their MasterCard, they have, well, you name it. There are people around offering credit for it. And in fact, you can't even walk through Sears anymore without getting stopped by somebody or attempted to stop by somebody at the door wanting to give you a, some kind of credit. I guess either store credit or their Discover card or whatever else it may be. I mean, I, I, you know, it, it gets annoying, actually, walking in there. I, I've already got a wallet full of plastic. I, I've got more than I want. I've even gotten rid of some of mine because I got tired of carrying them all around and got tired of paying service charges because even if you don't pay interest, you pay an annual service charge on the thing. So I trim mine back, and she's trying to get me to take more. Total debt at this particular time was, say, $3,700. That's a lot of debt, isn't it? A lot of money. But I don't think there's anything terribly unusual about this, and I'm not going to ask any of you to tell. Well, you, you, you have an anonymous thing on your little thing there about certain uh, things in your, uh, of your debts, but I'm not going to ask you to tell me this kind of figure. Now, every month they got bills from all people. The bill required... A minimum payment. The minimum payment was interest plus principal. Now, I think probably the minimum payment varies from, from perhaps the, the whatever institution it is to another. Some of them may work it out over a 36-month basis. Some of them may work it out longer than that. And they will actually have it as though you are paying it down in 36 months. And they will have a minimum amount you have to pay on principal. And they will have your accumulated interest for the month. If I recall correctly, this young couple, and basically it is a real couple, but the numbers may be a little bit off. Don't worry about that. The principal is what we're looking for. I think their interest payments would average, say, $70 per month. $70 per month doesn't seem in a way like a lot of money, does it? Uh, it's something someone could tuck into their budget and probably not notice. Now, what you need to understand is the interest on all these, this type of account is quite high. It runs up to 24, I think in some states it can be as high as 25% interest on credit card accounts. And you have to understand why it is. If you're using your credit card for a vacation or for a meal in a restaurant, the people who lent you that money can't very well repossess that meal. They have no collateral. So consequently, the interest, their risk is high and their interest rate is going to be high whenever they let you pay for it over time. So oftentimes, as high as 24%. This young couple, I think, were averaging, we'll say, $70 per month in what they were paying. Their principal payment may have been, it's hard to know for sure, but I'm going to estimate they made about $100. 36 months at $100, you could pay off. A month, you could pay off $3,600, couldn't you? So here we go. We got, say, $100 a month. 
and $70 being made on, on payments. That's a payment of $170 per month. Everybody with me? You understand where we are? $3,700 in outstanding bills. The bill comes in. A minimum, we've got to pay $100 for the principal, $70 for the interest. All right? Now, this would be one thing if this thing was going to be paid off in 36 months. But the pernicious thing about these accounts is that they are revolving accounts. They do not have to be paid off. In fact, they don't want you to pay them off. They want you to borrow more money. They want you to approach your credit limit. I mean, after all, if you could find a place where you could lend money for 24% a month, I mean, 24% a year, how do you feel about lending money at 24%? Now, there are risks involved, of course, and you're going to write off some of those loans, to be sure. But nevertheless, that's an awfully good rate of return. And if you're a good customer, and if you do pay monthly, they surely want you to keep right on borrowing money from them. The minimum payment has to be made, but you can charge more during the month. A lot of people make their $170 payment, and then they go right out and charge another $100 on the credit cards. And so, in the end of the month, where are they? Right back where they were. They owe $3,700 again, and they owe $70 in interest again. Do you realize that there are people who do this all their lives? They maintain a credit balance, and they just keep on using it, and they keep on paying interest, and they pay it on month after month after month. Now, let me see if we understand this. I want to see if you're with me. They are charging to their accounts $100 a month, and they are making a payment of $170 a month. How many of you think this is a good deal? You're going to the store, you're buying $100 worth of stuff every month. And when your bill comes in, you're paying $170. You know, that sounds like 70% interest. And I'll bet you after a few years, it feels like it. For example, as I say, it sounds like 70% interest. But let's say we're, we've been doing this for about 10 years. The stereo packed up a long time ago. The television burned its tube out, and by the time we got through, the guy told us it was going to cost more to repair it than to buy a new one. That television set's gone. The clothing has all been worn out, and we've forgotten about the vacation that we took on it. All that stuff is gone. There's nothing left of any of it. And you are still buying $100 worth of goods for which you are paying $170 a month. Month after month after month. What is the difference, the effective difference in your life between that and 70% interest? Well, you know, that's the way it goes. Now, there is a difference because you borrowed somebody's money. And they're entitled to return on their money. But, the, but as I say, the effect on you is a different matter. You know, this is exactly the same. And I want you to think about this. This is exactly the same as going out and, and borrowing $3,700 to buy your first round of goods. And then never making another payment on principal. Living the rest of your life paying cash for everything and just paying $70 a month or whatever it is on that $3,700 for the next 50 years. So you did all that when you were 20 years old. When you're 70 years old, you're still paying interest on that $3,700 that you bought way back then, of which the goods are all gone. But since that time, you have been paying cash for all that kind of stuff because you're at your credit limit. You've got to pay cash. My question is, how would your life have been different if you had saved for that first $3,700 worth of stuff, instead of borrowing for the first $3,700 worth of stuff. You see, for the privilege of spending $3,700 they didn't have, this couple, they wound up paying $840 a year from now on. That's 40, I'm sorry, $70 times 12. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you could find something to do with $840 if you had it right now? How many of you? Some of you are being shy about it. You just really, or actually, I think some of you didn't get their hand up because they were suddenly running through all this list of, of things they could do. In a lifetime, and I realize some of these numbers are a little bit arbitrary, but in a lifetime, how much money would you have spent for that $3,700 worth of stuff? I'll tell you, I'll tell you in categories. Let's say you bought it when you were out at age 20. 
You know, and, and you go through this whole rest of your life doing this type of thing, all the way up to age 70, 50, 50 years. And it, it can happen to you if you want to do it this way. That amounts to $45,700 for $3,700 worth of stuff. How many of you think that's a good deal? <laughs> we got one unusual person down here. We'll talk about it later. I think it's a good deal. <laughs> for who? I own the credit card company. Ah. <laughs> Does that get it in focus? Now, to be honest, To be honest, it won't really cost you $45,700. It won't really cost you that. Because suppose, instead of paying $70 a month in interest to my friend down here, <laughs> you go see my other friend, Skip Martin, back here, who's the president of Pocahontas Federal Savings and Loan. And you have a chat with him about how you might be able to put that $70 a month to use. And he said he'd be very happy to chat with any of you if you wanted to know a little bit about instruments and, and ways in which you can actually put your money to use. I suppose you go see Skip over here, and you say, instead of giving my $70 a month to him, I want to give my $70 a month to you. What kind of a deal will you make for me? Well, if all you got is $70 to start with, they can probably earn, what, five and a quarter, five and three, five and a half percent at Pocahontas Federal now. now but we all know that as you begin to develop your, you know, accumulate a little bit of cash, you can do a lot better than that. And it doesn't take a whole lot of cash before you can get, what, what do you pay on your money market type accounts up there? About 8% now, somewhere in that vicinity? 7, 16, 7. So, yeah. I actually, I'm, you know, I, I, at a money market mutual fund now, I'm, I've been getting 8. I think it just now dropped below 7, uh, below 8 to like 7, 9. It's been running over 8 all along. So I, I just thought, well, let's, let's find somebody, let's pay him our money, our $70 a month, and once we get the thing into the account and operating, we're going to be getting, say, 8% return on our money over a long period of time. And I worked that out. If you invest $70 in a money market account at 8%, and you do this over the same period of time we're talking about, where it would have cost us $45,000 in payments just added out, in the same period of time, you would net before, I'm sorry, gross, before taxes. We're not going to, the, the internal revenue service is another subject altogether. Before taxes. Are you ready for this? You would have $558,992.32. But there would be a cost for it. You will have to postpone the purchase of $3,700 worth of stuff. Now, how many people do we have here who are over 65? Do you, would you people have a place for a half a million dollars in cash in your life? And all that is is $70 a month, which you were paying somebody anyway. Why not pay yourself? And that is the simple, clean, down-to-earth, basic point that I want to make with you this morning. It is the most important consideration in being able to leave an inheritance for your children's children, which you can use, by the way, until you're gone. All that money is in your hand. You get to live on the, on, the, on the interest of it. You get to enjoy the house you're living in. You get to enjoy all the stuff you've got until you're gone, and you're still able to leave something for your children's children. You know, this, this fundamental principle is what makes the difference, is instead of paying somebody else, you pay yourself first. And then let other people pay you for the privilege of using your money instead of you paying them for the privilege of using theirs. It is just that simple. Now, I've told you all I've told you to tell you this simple point. Paying interest is bad. Receiving interest is good. You all got that? You understand that? Paying interest is bad. I skip over here is cringing a little bit. <laughs> receiving interest is good. My friend, the credit card bring up me down here is, is cringing over this, you know. <laughs> so, now, when I was in my 20s, 
I was not very enthusiastic about saving. Because, you know, somebody said, well, you've got to save. And all the things said save. And, and we, you know, my wife and I saved. We really did. We had $30 a month that we were putting in a savings account at 3-something percent back in the 50s when we got married. And, uh, but we did save, but I wasn't very enthusiastic about it, and I had no particular desire to, to put a lot of money. And I thought of saving in terms of, well, it's a thing for a rainy day. It's something if emergency happens. It's, uh, you know, if I'm out of a job, or because I wasn't worried about being out of a job. I was in the Navy, and the Navy wasn't going to let me be out of a job, at least not for several years now. So, now, is, do you see a problem with encouraging young people to save for a rainy day? Young people don't believe in rainy days. They believe they're immortal. They're going to live forever. Nothing bad is going to happen to me. You know, this is going to go on, or I will have time later. Or, better yet, if I really get in trouble, I can go talk to Dad. Now, for a lot of us, it's too late to talk to Dad. Way too late. But I want you to understand something about saving. Nobody ever really took in hand when I was in my 20s to explain to me what I just explained to you. That half a million dollar figure will blow your socks off. And when you think in terms of, of a lifetime, if someone could have helped me understand that, they would have gotten my attention. My problem was I wanted things and I wanted them now. Didn't want them sometime off in the future. Now, nor did anybody tell me, really, so that I would understand it, that everyone needs to save for two reasons. Actually, you really need to have two kinds of savings. Not just saving for two reasons. You need to have two kinds of savings. And depending upon your discipline, you need to have them in two different accounts. Maybe even in two different kinds of accounts. And that you work them in two different kinds of ways. The one kind is saving for the things you want to buy. No problem with that, is there? But you see, if you just think in terms of saving, period, well, then you save, and then you get ready to buy something, and you think, well, wait a minute. If I buy this, all my rainy day money is gone. But even that, you know, once again, we're back to rainy day money, and that is not the reason. The first reason is to save for the things you want. The second reason is not money for a rainy day. The second reason for saving is to invest and the reason to invest, why should you want to invest? To increase your net worth? No. Net worth doesn't mean much except as a figure on the balance sheet. The reason why investments are important is one reason only, to increase your income. If you think of Investing in any other terms, you are likely to make a serious mistake. Think of investing in terms of increasing your income. Now, suppose you hit the rainy day. Suppose you do have the crisis. You, if you have been setting aside money as an investment, that money is there. You have something there. You could possibly use the money you were saving for a car. You could possibly use the money. The rainy day, you would have something. So you save to invest with a view to increasing your income. Now, if you have two brain cells in a row, you do understand that it takes a little time to accumulate enough money to make a significant difference in your income, right? So if you saved $1,000 and you're, and you're making 8% on it, what do you got? 80 bucks. Well, 80 bucks is no big deal. You can blow 80 bucks just like that. But the problem, see, is that as I pointed out to you earlier, that 80 bucks a month or $70 a month over a long period of time does begin to make a difference. The income on a half a million dollars is substantially more, isn't it? And that's enough that if you were able to leave that kind of money for your children, would it make a difference? Would it make a difference down through generations of your family if your children followed the same principles that you followed in your life? As I say... No one really helped me to understand that particular point. So there are, I think, some rules that I would like to, to advocate to all of you. One, never pay interest on entertainment. Don't borrow money for entertainment, for vacations or TV or stereo, because all those things are entertainment. Just don't borrow money. Don't pay interest for entertainment. 
don't pay interest for clothes. Don't pay interest for luxuries. Don't pay interest for anything except two things. Basic transportation and basic housing. Now, why in the world would I offer those two exceptions? Well, transportation. You have got to get to work. If you don't have the money to go out and pay cash for a car, you've got it to do. You know, there's, nothing, there's no way of getting around to it. So, for basic transportation, you have got to get to work. Now, my reason for telling you it's okay to borrow money for basic housing in other words, to buy a home, is not for the reasons that people often tell you. It is not because it is such a large sum of money nobody could ever save it up, because that is not true. That is not true. Why is it? Why is it? Hmm? Inflation. Inflation is a factor, but that's not the reason. Pardon? It costs a lot, but that's not the reason. Pardon? It does cost less in the long run. Appreciation. Appreciation, but you may not always get that. Rent. The point is, you will pay interest. How many of you are renting? Do all you people know that you are paying interest on a property? I got a house in, on, on Corey Street in White House. I have a tenant in that house. I own it. I actually pay interest on it myself. But I own that house. My tenant pays me $595 a month to live in that house. I pay $500 and about $45 to the mortgage company for that house, which includes principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Tell me, is my tenant paying interest? Is he paying taxes? What else is he paying? He's paying me. <laughs> when he ought to be paying himself. Now, I feel happy about this because a lot of people who do rent, and there's nothing wrong with renting, by the way, because you've got a place to live. And sometimes you haven't got the down payment, sometimes you haven't got this, sometimes you haven't got some of the things you need to be able to buy a house. And in that period of time, or maybe you're not going to be there long enough to make buying a house practical. So there's nothing to be ashamed about about renting. Nothing at all. But on this one handout, I want you to take this handout here and just study it just for a minute. Because this actually is real stuff from a real town. The real town is Tyler, Texas, because that's where we live. My wife prepared this for us. I'm sorry? Okay, I've got a couple of others here that didn't have a handout. The handout is on should you rent or buy a home. My wife put this together uh, based upon real situations that we know about in Tyler, Texas. And if you'll notice on here... It will lay out for you the type of things that you have to pay if you're a homeowner, the principal and interest and taxes and insurance. That's what P&I is, is principal and interest. MIP is mortgage, let's see, mortgage insurance payment or something or other that you have to pay, a premium, I think it is. Anyway, all this stuff is here. I won't, I'm not going to go through it with you with great detail, but I want you to be aware of this because here's where it lays out for you the actual kind of costs you pay on, on renting or owning a house. And I think it will become clear very soon, that what you need to be doing in your life is you need to be saving to get into your own home. Those of you who are those of you who are renting, those of you who are not are renting for any other reason other than, let's say, you're, you're transient, you're moving on, you can't stay put, people need to do their best to get into their own home. Save for that down payment. And like I say, I'm willing to see you pay interest on that because that's important. Now, it is necessary, and one of the fundamental principles that's involved in all of this is that it is necessary sometimes to forego a present good for a future good. I want you to understand, though, that I am not advocating austerity. So much of the time when you hear this type of thing as a young person, all you hear is an old person saying, well, you ought to do without. Boy, when I was your age, I had to walk two miles to school, and I couldn't get 50 cents to go to the circus, and I couldn't. We hear all these stories, don't you, when I was your age? And kids don't believe you ever were their age. (laughs) 
The fact is, austerity is the pits. Nobody likes austerity, and I am not advocating austerity. What I am saying is that if you don't want to live all your life in austerity, you've got to do without a few things now. You can't have everything you want now. You've got to postpone things until you can pay for them so you don't have to pay for the rest of your life the equivalent of 70% interest. Now, as I said before, there are some other considerations, like, for example, this car. How would you like to walk into a dealer and pay cash for the car of your choice? Does that sound good? Yeah, I see this thing. Boy, a beautiful car, you know, shiny, fenders and all that type of stuff. I would, it would be nice to be able to walk in there and say, how much is that thing cash money? You know, most of us believe we can get a better deal if we pay cash than if we borrow. And that is true on the, uh, in one way and not so much true in the other. The dealer wants you to borrow money, especially to borrow money from him or his credit corporation or whoever he sends you to and gets a kickback from or however that works. How would he feel about it? You like, like the idea of maybe going in and paying cash. Just write out a check, drive out in your new car, and have no payments to make on it at all. Okay. How many of you people here are driving a car now? All righty. Here's how we do this. I'm not going to ask you how many people here are making payments on cars because that's personal. But most of those hands would go back up again. When you finish making payments on your car, whenever the last payment goes in, so much of the time what we want to do is turn right around and go out and get another one. Because all of a sudden we have freed up the money that we were making for payments on that car and we think, well, look, I can take my car and those payments and get a better car. And I can upgrade and I can do more. Okay. Here's what I'm going to advocate. When you get that last payment made, keep your old car and start making those payments to skip. Which I mean to your account in Skip's bank. Start paying yourself the same payment you're making before. We already know you can make it, right? You made it for three years. Or five? Well, yeah, that's true. The way cars are getting now, sooner or later they're going to have 30-year mortgages on them like they do on houses. <laughs> Keep making those payments and make them to yourself. Now, the figures may change, but this, you know, I realize that I may be completely out of the reach of a lot of people here. That's fully understand. But let's talk about the principle. The payments on a new $12,000 car, or let's say a loan for $12,000 on a brand new car, the payments would be $398 a month. That's a 12% 36 months. Now, I, don't, I didn't even multiply that out to see how much that actually costs you. And, you know, all you've got to do is multiply 398 times 12, and you'll know how much you're actually going to pay for that new car if you borrow the money to pay it. Now, let me, let's, let's make a supposition at this point. Let's suppose that you pay yourself the same payment at 8%. Now, mind you, you're going to be paying them 12% for the privilege of using their money. But if you will invest that money yourself, you can get 8% back for 36 months. And you just make that payment. Keep on making it. Keep on driving your car. Now, I can hear you already. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll get about another year into driving that car, and my air conditioning compressor will go out. Big deal. How much is that air compressor, replacing that compressor going to cost you? One monthly payment. About. Maybe a little more. Depends on where you get it. You can pay $500 for it. You can go get rebuilt one. You can do a lot of things. But it would cost you one monthly payment. How much money will you have in 36 months to play with? You will not have $12,000 to go down and buy your new car with. You will have $16,240 to go down and buy your new car with. You can buy a better car. But a funny thing is going to happen to you on the way to the car dealership. <laughs> you are not going to feel the same about writing a $16,240 check as you will about writing a $398 check. Are you? You're just not going to feel the same about it. 
Now, the fact that you're going to write out those checks over, over a three-year period anyway in payments, that just doesn't, you know, that doesn't seem to hit us the same way. The psychology of paying cash for things like this is every bit as important as anything else in the whole thing. Because it is only when you go down there and write out a check for 600 and some odd dollars for your television set that you really do understand what that thing costs you. That's how you understand. The problem is when you make payments on the thing, it costs you much more and you don't understand even that. It's painless. And you don't understand it because you don't think about it. You don't sit down and add it up. Now we get all the way down to saying, I called this thing today financial planning, and I haven't even talked about financial planning yet. Whenever you get that $16,240 or whatever that amount of money is, that you can go down and write a cash check for another car. That's when financial planning starts. That's when you begin to realize, wait a minute. Do I really want a brand new car that costs $16,500? Do I really need a car that costs sixteen or 12000 do I want this? Do I need this? Is this where I'm really going? You will start thinking about it, and you will be planning before you know the difference. When you start paying cash. And the secret to paying cash is simple. You stop paying interest. It is a choice. It's a choice that is right in your hands. Now, my, I would advocate when you get home, you take a look at those credit card bills. And on any credit card bill that you find yourself paying interest, take your scissors, cut it in two, and throw it away. That is going to probably create some austerity. You're probably going to wonder how you're going to be able to manage to get some of the things you've got to have. Well, I don't know. You'll have to figure it out. That's also where some degree of financial planning starts. Credit cards in and of themselves are not bad. What is bad about them is the sneaky marketing techniques and the tactics used by some of the institutions to get you to borrow money at a very unfavorable rate. They make a lot of money at it. It keeps the economy going. It makes the United States bubble right along. But let the other people keep the economy going. You consider your children and your children's children and even consider being able to enjoy yourself until your dying day all the things that you're going to leave to your children and your children's children. And all this is in your hands. Just stop paying other people in areas that you don't have to. Basic transportation, that is four wheels to get you to work, it makes sense. And it won't take you long to get to where you can pay cash for that. If you just start saving and start saving now. You might say, oh, I can't. I mean, everything is gone. I get, you know, every, every penny is gone at the end of the month. Well... I tell you, you can. The amount may be very small. It may be so small that if you went down to see Skip, he'd say, well, I'm sorry, we don't take deposits this small. I don't know, how small a deposit do you take? Get down to $10. $10. Skip will take $10. I don't know about your bank, but he will. <laughs> will, you, will you give... How much would the association pay? No, I mean the association. $10. Same amount. Ten dollars. How much will you, interest will you pay on ten dollars? Five and a half percent. You can start. Ten dollars a month. Five and a half percent. Maybe a little more later. You have to start somewhere. I don't know. I don't know if, that, if thirty dollars a month was. Was that where we started? We started at thirty dollars a month when we were married. And so, and that was back in nineteen. Well, I won't tell you about that. My wife may not want you to know that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it is. Uh, it can be done, and it can happen. You know, there's a funny thing, too, about this. When you do that 13 months, you know, that, I'm sorry, that 36 months at $389 a month, you saved up all your money, you've got $1,640 a month, got all in your hand, you know something else you have? You still got your old car. You still have it. It's still out there running. And because you knew you were going to do this, you probably changed the oil on time. You probably took better care of it than a lot of cars you'll see out there. You know, you wonder, I wonder if this thing will go 10 years. <laughs> and and, 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 and $12,000 or $10,000, that's a down payment on a house. Good house. And I, can, and I can make, I'm already making rent payments of $450 a month. 
and I can take this $398 a month, and I can put it on top of that, that'll buy, a, it'll buy this house and have money left over, the one we gave you in the handout. And you can own your own home, cut your own grass, <laughs> plant your own roses, have a garden, a backyard where your kids can play, a tree to climb, place for the dog, the American dream, owning your own home. And it's a question of choices that we make in fundamental financial planning. This grows out of a desire in all that, that all of us should have to lay up for our children's children. And like John said when he wrote his letter, Beloved, I wish above all things that you might prosper and be in health. Because, you know, after all, it is nice to know well-to-do people, isn't it? I hope all of you are able to get that way, as a, not, not because money is important and not because things are important, but because people who are good stewards of the things that God puts in their hands learn a lot of very valuable lessons, and they are there to help the people, other people, who need to learn the same things to dig themselves out of their holes and to have a better life as well. Thank you for your attention. We'll take about a 10-minute break here and be back at 9.30.